1918. I'm sure you've heard about it at this point, but these were the deaths that occurred and, and the way that they occurred. And so, as you can see, there were three different peaks during that time frame. Um, now, in the U.S., we're not out of our first peak uh, here yet, but this pattern is not atypical for the majority of pandemic events, including the Hong Kong flu of 1967, um, and a variety of others, including the bubonic plague. This is what it tends to look like. So we tend to see multiple waves and it is entirely likely that that will happen again, even though we're still in our first wave, recognize that we'll probably see a decrease in cases to the point until we see a vaccine announced. Um, and then we'll probably start to drop social distancing measures. We'll start to drop some of those things that are creating protections for us right now and probably see another spike in the cases, even though the vaccine is out. So just know that we might be planning for multiple waves or multiple cycles of this. And so it's always good to keep that in mind as we look to uh, future proof ourselves against what's occurring right now. Um, here are 10 ideas that I wanna talk through today, um, hopefully in relatively rapid succession uh, to get us to what it is we might be able to do when we talk about that rural innovation model or, or what might be working for us. And the first of the things that we've got to understand is that we need to redefine what risk looks like. We have this fallacy that the way we've always done it um, is, is safe, when in fact, it's actually been deeply, deeply unsafe. And I'm sure that many of you have encountered <laughs> the hard way, uh, those locations and those uh, operations where the way we've always done it has created that deeply unsafe situation for you. And some of you have probably been able to adjust fairly well um, if you are less in a less risk averse place. And some of you have probably had a real challenge adjusting to what that new normal looks like. So part of this is this is an opportunity for us to cement in our heads that the way we've always done it is has always been deeply unsafe. And all it took was something to go ahead and tilt it um, and so that we can recognize this. So we spend a lot of time talking about our fear of change um, and not nearly as much time talking about what happens if we don't change. Um, I'm not scared of the old ideas. I'm, you know, I'm not scared of the new ideas. I'm scared of the old ones, right? And, and, and a little bit of, of that. So as you think about your operations, your community, your response, redefine that risk for a second and, and don't get so complacent about the part where the way we've always done it is the way that we should continue to do it. Because the fact of the matter is doing nothing has very real consequences. Um, this is uh, you know, I-35 bridge in Minnesota many, uh, about a decade ago, maybe 15 years ago now. Um, at the time, they had indicated, they knew that the bridge rating uh, for this bridge, which had a sufficiency rating of 50, which is government speak for bad bridge. Uh, one of the things we love doing in government is making bigger words and more complicated things more complicated, right? Uh, but the truth was, is that this bridge had a sufficiency rating of 50, which meant that we knew it was a bad bridge. And so when it collapsed, they went back and tried to get funding for the additional bridges that had a sufficiency rating of less than 50. Now, the year before, no luck whatsoever. The year after the bridge collapsed, guess what? All of the bridges in the state with a sufficiency rating of less than 50 were funded for repairs. Doing nothing has very real consequences, especially when we deal with large organizations that are responsible for huge sections of our population, like our local governments, like our healthcare institutions. So we've just got to recognize that redefining risk is a critical part of our understanding of what it looks like to go forward with successful innovation in our communities. And that's because the future and the past do not look alike. I brought that up. Let me, let me give you a few examples. Um, Probably hard to decide what this is right here, but this image is actually what snow, uh, you know, snow rolling used to look like. Believe it or not, 150 years ago, no one had ever plowed snow. Think about that. Here we are in Colorado. We deal with snow removal, moving snow all the time. 150 years ago, they had snow wardens whose job it was to go out and smooth the snow over because at the time, horse-drawn uh, carriages, you could attach ski-like runners to the bottom of them and make for really smooth travel. So snow was actually a boon to horse-drawn carriages because it allowed for smooth travel. The biggest issue of the day was actually covered bridges where they would have to go and actually shovel snow onto the covered bridge area to make sure that the travel continued smoothly. Um, so again, 150 years ago, snow plowing had never existed. That started in 1862 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Go Milwaukee. Uh, I'm sure nobody's raising their hand and doing that. Never, never get a shout out in Milwaukee, but this is their thing right here. Um, 150 years ago, snow plowing had never existed. 140 years ago, standard time did not exist. 
you know, here it is, something that we do every single day. We know our time down to the minute, down to the second. We're all on this call at the same time. And that's because we have standard time. Standard time didn't even exist 140 years ago. The battle for standard time got fought in the city of Detroit, Michigan. Um, and it was actually a political fight. One mayor said, we want to bring economic development to Detroit. And therefore, we need the trains to run on time. And that was the real thing that made standard time such an important thing for America. And in fact, then the world was the trains. Um, and so we created standard time in the central standard time zone because that mayor won. The other mayor said, I'm not going to tell you how to keep your time. And the, the, the residents of Detroit actually said, you know what, I think we'll take the economic development route. Um, so that's where standard time came from. 100 years ago, there had never been a radio broadcast. So think about that. Never had been, never a radio broadcast. We think of AM, FM radio as old hat, old news, right? But at the same time, 100 years ago, there had never been a radio broadcast. And less than 30 years ago, there had never been a smartphone. Now, I'm sure we're all carrying around the original smartphone or IBM Simons in our pocket. Um, you know, but, but at the same time, think about how much this changes everything about how we interact with others. So here it is. We've only been dealing with this disruption for 30 years ago. So if your community or your planning efforts took place, you know, to even 25 years ago, there's a good possibility that they never even considered cellular connection as something that was relevant or important in terms of how they were doing. So again, the future and the past do not look alike. So redefining risk is incredibly important as we look forward into the future. And here's one of my favorite examples. This is a sexy little nematode uh, for those of you worm lovers out there called C. elegans. Uh, they have spent billions of dollars investing in understanding this little nematode. And the reason that this worm is so important is because it shares a gene with us that when switched off, it, it allows for aging to happen at a much slower rate. So the typical lifespan of the C. elegans worm is anywhere from uh, one to one and a half months. When that genome is actually switched off, the worms live anywhere from four to six months long. Guess who else has that genome? We do. It is entirely possible. They've been working on this for over a decade. Some of the brightest minds, some of the biggest funders have been working on basically uh, the fountain of youth for over a decade and they're getting closer and closer to this. It's possible that in some of our lifetimes, we may be able to extend our lifetimes and slow our rate of aging. How does that fundamentally change the way that you deliver service and even just live your life? Most of what we think of happens to occur in our lifespans. Now that didn't used to be the case, right? Multi-generational thinking was the norm in the, you know, way back in the day, right? You know, the dark ages, the middle ages, the pyramids, right? Not today. Today we think of everything in terms of our lifespan. Um, but if your lifespan doubled, <clears throat> how would that change just about everything? Or if the lifespan of those in your community doubled, how would that change how you view everything? So again, the future and the past don't look alike. Um, so don't be afraid to do something radically different. Another thing we can do is to establish innovation guidelines. One of the most challenging things for employees and those folks in the field or those that we work with is that they don't have a clear idea of when they're when it's okay for them to make decisions on the fly. When am I empowered to make a choice on behalf of the community, on behalf of my team, on behalf of my organization? So do yourself the favor and provide clear guidance. Now, here are three things that I recommend just using as the general litmus test. And if you can answer yes to all of these, then we're on to something there, right? So does this solve an important problem? And are we the right ones to solve the problem? If we can answer yes to that question, that's critically important. If the answer is no, it might be that we need to activate a partner who are the right people to deal with that problem, but we have to know that the answer to that is yes. Does this protect the safety of our residents or employees? The answer must be yes to that. And does this adhere to our organizational values? Again, a moral litmus test that our employees and teams can use in the field. If you're answering yes to all of those, the answer should be for our employees to have the ability or the flexibility to be able to make innovative choices in the field or on the fly. Um, if they know that they're answering yes to those, you know, hopefully they're not going to face any kind of retribution or punishment for doing something like that. So th that's something that I encourage communities to do because it really pushes uh, down those innovation opportunities into the people doing the work and especially in rural communities where so many of our teams wear so many different hats for our communities uh, this is a critically important thing is that we have some understanding and agreement on, on where we lean in on those things.
Another technique we can use is an innovation fund. Now, typically, when I talk with organizations about this, it's you know a city or a county. Um, and in a city and a county environment, maybe you've got some funding or access to funding. This concept works really well in a partnership environment as well, when we have some level of funding, uh, funding dollars to be able to help with this. This is literally the form that we used um, in Adams County. This is, uh, and I'm gonna share with you a QR code here in a second that you can scan that will allow you to download an online version of this, okay? Um, but part of this is about creating an opportunity to innovate um, while mitigating organizational risk and minimizing individual risk. If we have an access to a small amount of dollars that we are sharing, people can contribute their ideas to that, which means we can get the best ideas out of our employees, out of our teams, out of our network, right? That allows us to define and clarify what success looks like. You'll notice in the sheet on the right hand side, um, on the right hand side there, at the bottom there are some criteria. It was very clear what the criteria for selection looks like, so people know how you're making those choices. You can use this fund to go into the community and ask for the community and scholarship their ideas. So again, lots of different ways to structure this. Um, the best part is the fund should not be large. So you need to keep it simple to apply. We don't want to create administrative burden. That's one of the big killers of innovation is a lot of administration overseeing it, right? Um, the fund should not be too large, which usually shocks people. But the larger the fund, the more people will try and use it as a workaround for something that should go through a budget process. What we're trying to do is pilot ideas though. So what we're after is that sort of entrepreneurial mindset, right? That, that yes, we can spirit, you need a little bit of seed funding to get your idea tested and proven. And if it works, we can go through a budget process to fund it appropriately in the future. So pilot projects only. The best part about this is you decide the criteria, what works for you. So for us, it was original, impactful, uh, practical, measurable, reproducible, and sustainable. And if it had those things, that was what we defined as an innovative project. Um, you identify a selection committee. Typically, I'll train teams and communities that I go to on what creativity and implementation look like under the framework of innovation. So usually we create a common language so that people can have a common speaking language uh, when it refers to innovation. And what, what this also does is allows us to go ahead and then have a selection committee of people who have been trained to recognize what that looks like. Their job is to help grow the ideas and select the ideas. So not only there, are they there to go ahead and provide some level of financial oversight, um, but they can act as a guiding committee. They can help improve the ideas and they can offer um, sometimes resource support as well to be able to get those ideas off the ground. But the focus of this and the whole point of an innovation fund is to get action behind the ideas. Um, so here's the actual form itself. I'm going to skip a little bit of this. We'll make sure that uh, I'll make sure that Kate gets a copy of this and you're welcome to use it as well. These are the types of things included, right? The basic info, your title, your project summary, impact statement, uh, what's the cost of the proposal? What resource needs do we have? What's the project timeline? Um, potential risks, criteria for scoring. And you can see that criteria again there at the bottom, original, impactful, practical, measurable, reproducible, sustainable. Very simple form, very easy to use. Here it is. If you got a phone right now and you pull out your camera, this is a QR code. If you scan this, it's going to try and take you to a website. The website is listed below, so you can take a screen grab of that if that doesn't work for you. But what this will do is take you to an online version that I created through SurveyMonkey for you to be able to use the same kind of concept electronically, okay? So I don't want you to have to start all over. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you want something to build off of, here's a template that you can build off of. Um, so hopefully you had the chance to go ahead and either scan that or screenshot it. Um, and again, we'll make sure that you've got this information after we get done too. For me, this is about piloting projects. Um, I think it's one of the most powerful and important steps in the, in the equation. When I teach sustainability, uh, we do a whole section on how to build rapid fire pilot projects and the elements that are success, uh, that are necessary for success in that, right? The goal here is to put our time into action. There are so many great ideas sitting on shelves collecting dust out there, as I'm sure you well know. Our goal here is to make sure that those ideas get turned into action and pilot projects are where we do that. In my personal career, I have had over 65 uh, first of their kind pilot projects uh, that I helped get to the next level, take off the ground or contributed in a meaningful, significant way. They, they range from small things to huge things, um, including some of the first community solar gardens in, in the entire country, um, all the way down to running a banner bag program from reused 
banners in our downtown um, and sewing those into bags and selling them to tourists, right? In order to fund our community garden that we built, right? All of these little things playing together, but pilot projects are where the rubber meets the road and that's where we can prove a concept that works or it doesn't work. And so it's important for us as we go through pilot projects to get dispassionate about the result, which can be really difficult to do, especially when we love the idea we're talking about, right? So it's so important that we focus on getting that action behind those ideas. Here's a couple of the pilot projects uh, that we ran in Adams County that I really loved. Um, on the left, you'll see a few things that we can do to prep it. But on the right here, just walking through the walking through them, the top left right there is an iPad program. Um, we had over 168,000 printed pages per year for boards and commissions in Adams County. Um, and so we said, we're not doing that anymore. We're going to provide you with an iPad. We'll make sure it's uh, up to date. We'll make sure it's got access to the files you need. And that eliminated 168,000 printed pages per year. Um, upper right was the treadmill desk. This was a dismal failure. By the way, the gentleman walking on it, it was his idea. What I will say is uh, you've never met anybody who was more proud of a failed idea than that gentleman right there. Um, but what ended up happening was a huge uh, snafu. It seemed like a great idea, lots of support for it. But in practical reality, people viewed it as somebody being able to goof off at work. So we had created a rentable space where you could use this. And people ended up, uh, as they'd walk by and see somebody, be like, boy, I wish I had time to go walk around on a treadmill. And so there was so much social backlash on it. Uh, we tried to go ahead and fog the windows. And then our risk team came in and said, look, you can't do that because if somebody falls off the treadmill and breaks their hip or leg in there, you know, you've got a problem. So they wanted to install a panic button, but they installed it right next to the door and a person fell off the back of the treadmill desk when they were walking, bumped into the button and they had tied the button, and I'm not kidding you, into the fire alarm system, thereby evacuating the entire facility. All tied back to the treadmill desk. Now I'm gonna say, terrible failure on some level, but at the same time, that's what the point is about, learning. <clears throat> Sorry, I digressed. Uh, Cash Closet is one of my very favorite programs. It stands for clothing, accessories, shoes, and hygiene. One of the biggest challenges you have when you're um, unemployed or underemployed or low or don't have access to certain resources is that you can't have the clothing or the um, hygiene that you need in order to be able to walk in and present professionally for an interview. So we created a closet where people could come and get the professional clothes lightly used that they needed in order to be able to go in. They could get toiletries and be able to um, you know, get, get access to shaving cream. And, and, and we would even in some cases put them up in a hotel for the night so that they would have a chance to get a good night's sleep and then go in. Job placement rates went through the roof and this program was adopted more widely even by the entire state of Colorado. So one idea from one employee that was about this big that has grown into a massive success effort. And again, a, a mechanism that we use to increase the adoption rate for animals out of the shelter. But this is how we do pilot programs. We ask extreme questions to prepare for it. So for example, how small can we make the pilot and still learn a lesson, right? How fast can we execute that, right? How do we scale it quickly? So if all of a sudden demand goes through the roof, be prepared for your success just as much as your failure, right? And how are we gonna scale up this concept quickly if it's successful? Our goal is to measure one to three things incredibly well. When we start to measure a lot more than that, then all of a sudden it becomes administratively burdensome for people to innovate. So we wanna measure one, two, or three things very well to prove whether an idea worked or did not work. If it worked, then we can scale the idea up, measure more things, and learn more lessons, right? Um, at the end, we always conduct what I call the blame-free autopsy. The goal there is to go ahead and dissect what occurred and find a better way to go forward without assigning blame to individuals. And then iterate, improve, scale up, pilot again if it's necessary. Um, this is part of creating our culture. In Adams County, we had 36 ideas submitted over three years. 30, were select, uh, 30 of those 36 were ultimately selected, and 24 of those were successful by their own measures. Um, and so again, you're looking at about a two-thirds success rate out of the total number of pilots. Here's how we deal with failure, okay? One of the hardest things to understand, but there's two different types of failure. There's failure of the heart and failure of the head, and they're very different. Failure of the head is incredibly forgivable. It's where we make a strategic error. We you know, try and go down a path and that seems to be the right direction. We use data to guide it. Um, and we had to make a tough choice and we made the choice and we went right when we should have gone left. That is a failure of the head. You know, um, The opportunity is there to learn lessons from that, get better, but we make mistakes and we've got to learn to get better about that. Failure of the heart is different. Failure of the heart is doing something that's amoral or unscrupulous. Um, 
we always have a different way of dealing with that. That should be dealt with from an HR uh, from an HR perspective. But failure of the head is one of those things that is a learnable, teachable, guidable moment. And so when we talk about it, we, we are looking to create a culture that tries, and that is an innovative culture. So even if it doesn't work, the fact that you don't react in a negative way, but use it as an opportunity for learning will signal everything to the folks on your team about how serious you are about innovation succeeding. Because it's, it's not the successes and the reaction to the successes that people should be gauging. It's the fear of the failure that people are worried about. And our reaction to that guides them on whether they're going to continue to innovate or going to shut down and walk away. And, and I, keep, I keep hearing this as like, I can't wait to, we're going to recover. We're going to recover. Oh, stop that nonsense. I hope you don't recover. Straight up. I want you to thrive. If we set the bar at recover, we have set the bar too low. Straight up. Move that bar. Move that bar higher, right? The fact is, is we can change just about anything we want to change right now. We have been given the urgent opportunity and a crisis at hand to be able to reinvent and reimagine how government gets delivered. And that's an incredibly powerful, important moment for us. This is not even a once in a generation opportunity or once in a lifetime opportunity. It's a once in a century opportunity for us to reinvent and reimagine how government gets delivered, especially in rural areas. You know, it fascinates me when I get into these innovation conversations, people look to larger cities and, and they're doing some great stuff. The fact is 97% of the land is in rural areas. You have the land. That's a really powerful thing. That means you can stop a problem that already exists in New York before it ever exists in your community. So the opportunity is there to do meaningful pilots and meaningful innovation in an environment with a lot less at stake, but a lot bigger opportunity at the end, right? Um, and so this is our opportunity to lead with that deep empathy, to find ways to connect with our community like never before. One of the biggest challenges that we tend to have with innovation is establishing urgency. Like I said, in this case, that has predominantly been solved for you. Um, you have a reason to innovate. The way we've always done it is not safe. And you've learned that. Maybe the hard way, hopefully not. Okay. But now we have an urgent reason to give people permission to actually reinvent how delivery of services occurs, um, especially in a post-COVID world, um, when we get there, by the way, right? Um, and so here's how we do it, right? We establish the urgency by, by making sure that we describe the situation with extreme candor. We have to be completely upfront about what it is we believe and what those assumptions look like. Um, we can ask uh, all of our employees, ask your residents, ask your partners to submit their ideas for review. Um, and here's how we did it. In Colorado Springs, when we faced the Great Recession, we pulled in, uh, we recognized that we had a, a $14, million, uh, $14 million budget shortfall that year. And that meant that 80 people were going to lose their jobs. So we pulled in 400 people over four days and got 400 different ideas from those employees um, that ended up turning into 10 meaningful, actionable ideas. Those 10 ideas saved half of that money, and we had to let 40 people go. The urgency was there. The crowdsourcing was what allowed us to save about half of the money that we needed to. So don't discount ideas coming from just about anywhere at this point, because we should be looking for those. And we have to prepare our teams for radical change. When it comes to change management, that's one of the things that people struggle with. It's one of the most important things we can do is prepare our teams for that radical change and let them know that that's coming. Um, with communities that I'm working with right now, I'm having them talk with people and say, look, if you're the city manager or an assistant city manager, remind your teams you have no FTEs. The community has FTEs. Now, how we deploy those FTEs is up to us. We have a way that we've been doing it. Is it the most effective for delivering service to our residents right now, of uh, to supportive supporting our communities right now? And that might not be the case. We have to reimagine economic development, right? That's going to be fundamentally different um, depending on how we've got our teams prepared. If we think we're waiting for the return to normal, that's just a waiting game. If we think that this means a new dawn is upon us, then we have an opportunity and an urgency that makes it possible for us to make that change happen, right? And remember, be kind to your employees. And I'm sorry, this is one of the last points on there, right? But reemphasize if you have psychological services available to people, please reemphasize that right now because we're going through the, um, we're about halfway through the first wave of the mental health crisis that's been created 
by the lack of interaction and some of what's going on here. So please remind folks of the services that they have available to make sure they stay healthy. Um, <clears throat> This is one of the techniques that I teach during my workshops. It's called predicting the future. So I'm gonna give you a real quick snapshot of what this looks like. Um, it's a lot of fun as an exercise and certainly I think is more valuable than the way that we traditionally do strategic planning. Um, traditionally what we do is we look at the past to inform the future. Well, that's silly. That would be like walking backwards. Of course you're gonna bump into the wall, <laughs> you know? So, so the goal here is to actually look to the future, which we know that the future and the past don't necessarily look alike. And, and now we can start to build backwards into the future that we want to see. So what we do is we identify a very specific problem 30 to 50 years out. We identify three to five, even up to seven possible future scenarios. So we say, okay, what does the world look like 50 years from now? We can write down the assumptions that we come up with and we can just have a conversation about what would this problem look like then? Then we determine which of those is most desirable and we start to build backwards. Now I wanna tell you, the example that I'm about to use is the one that I would use in my workshops. It has a slightly different tone though, however, given the current situation, but I want to use it as a point to demonstrate because this is what we're dealing with and it happens to be exactly the point of the future and the past don't look like. So here would be an example of it. What does healthcare look like for a 75 year old in the year 2060? Well, we could have all kinds of possible scenarios. So let's say we've got three of them. Healthcare will cease to exist because personal machines will replace doctors for medicine. All right, healthcare will be more timely because of high efficiency decentralized health services and the elimination of genetic diseases affecting the elderly. Or healthcare for the elderly will be without resources because of a global epidemic wiping out 20% of the population. And I'm not kidding you, this is the example I used to use. Now, that was a laughable situation. And in fact, I would typically follow it up with, well, we could have another scenario where we offered people over 75 the opportunity to compete in the Hunger Games. And whoever it was, was taken really good care of, you know, it was meant as something of a ridiculous example, but the truth is it's something of the truth now. Just goes to show the future and the past can be radically different, right? So what we do is we say, what has to be true in 2050 for that to be true in 2060? And we chose in this case that uh, more timely because of high efficiency decentralized healthcare services. So we say, what needs to happen in 2050? What needs to happen in 2040 for that to be true in 2050? what needs to be true in 2030 and so on and so forth until we get to three to five years out. And then we begin making those a reality and start to figure out what needs to shift in the way that we're currently thinking about things in order for that to become true. What happens when you build backwards to the current day environment is you'll notice some things that you're doing in the current day environment that are about the past looking forward and not about being in the future and thinking backwards. And you'll find that these outcomes end up looking very different but we can get tactical at three to five years out. And it's just about putting ourselves in a space to be present and ready when the future calls. And another one of my favorite techniques, and I've been um, working with some communities on setting up these things called plan ahead teams. Um, it's a great resource. I consider this a precursor in some ways to an innovation team if you don't have one in your community. Um, but what we do is we, we have usually two different groups maybe in our region. And again, I understand we're rural, so we're, we're really banding our resources together here. But chances are you have a, a COVID response team, a team that is looking at the right now and the right here in terms of how they're responding on a very tactical, very strategic, almost daily level. I highly recommend that you have a team of folks whose job it is to look into the future as well and start to look at different time horizons and start to see what's there. Um, so five timelines that I would recommend you look at. One would be this week, then two to four weeks out, then one to two quarters out, one to two years out, and then a new normal in the future. What our goal with this is, and then we map out what happens if things are good? What happens if things are neutral? What happens if things don't go well? Which means you ultimately have 15 different possibilities there. By doing that, what we can do is we can build out what the broad future and the commonalities of those broad futures look like. Then we can make intelligent strategic decisions and inform our current response team and let them know what it is we see on the horizon. That way, when the winds shift, we at least are, are having the boat pointed in the right direction. And we can start preparing now for that. McKinsey and company put out this great, uh, this great diagram, which I really love in terms of how this concept works. So again, talked about that COVID-19 crisis team that you probably already have stood up. Um, 
But this is how it would work is that you have a plan ahead team. And the goal of that planning group is to go ahead and come back and report into the COVID-19 crisis team. So there is a touch point that is regularly reinforming the sort of action team about what we see in the future. So I want you to think of this as like the Titanic and needing to turn, needing to take time to turn minus the iceberg or the inevitable conclusion, okay? Uh, but the opportunity for us to start steering the ship earlier than maybe we were ready for. And why rural? You know, as we talk through rural um, and, and, and what it means to be rural, this to me is one of the most important things and something I talk about with a lot of communities, um, which is 97% of, of the country's landmass is rural, but only 19% of the, uh, of the population lives there which means that land is the great opportunity of our rural spaces. This is not something that we should give away for free. I want you to think about what's happening in terms of urban decay. How much commercial office space currently sits occupied and will sit occupied going forward after this, right? Massive amounts of loss of the need for commercial office space coming out of this pandemic. What is that space going to be used for? So my teams, what I try and encourage folks to do from a planning perspective is think about how they're going to repurpose that now what will be gray field space into something that can actually spur an economic development. And I think the communities that figure out how to do that will be well positioned. But for those of us that don't have this challenge because we are more rural, it is also the argument on why it's okay for you to have strong restrictions around building on your land because you'll be living with the consequence of those forevermore. So as you think about the development of your community, the economic development of your community, it is so critical that we think about this aspect that you have the land and that is one of the most valuable resources and will continue to be the most valuable resource, uh, going, one of the most valuable resources going forward. Um, so with that said, definitely some questions I'd love to discuss with you on that, but I wanna pause here and stop sharing for a second. And let's see here. Not sure if we've got everybody on the call. We're You're good. good. Still? Okay. Did the presentation stop? I hope. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> um, any thoughts or questions about? And I ran through a lot of material very quickly there. So I, one, I, I hope that there's something in there that resonated with you, um, and that was my my hope. Um, but again, if there's anything in particular that you wanted me to to touch on, I would love to be able to do that. Then we can certainly open up some discussion and have a conversation. Ah, all the questions. Well, one, I'll say that Oliver did do a great job there. He threw in a shameless plug uh, on mental on mental health or whatever. So disaster behavioral mental health webinar on September 3rd. Um, so if you are looking for that resource, please do take the time to sign up for that. Definitely want to encourage that. I have a, I have a question, Nick. Yeah. So one of the things that um, I think is a really interesting idea and one of the things that this team's talked a lot about is how we find our strengths and our assets in our community and use them to their fullest right now. Yep. And of course, one of the things that we're really talking a lot about is what's winter going to look like um, when things are going to be markedly different and we're going to be indoors. Um, and it just seems, you know, like a very kind of an impossible answer or an impossible challenge. Um, so one of the things I'm wondering is if you've seen a community or um, a city that has used some crowdsourcing of ideas across like residents, like a platform to do that or a questionnaire to do that, where we have, you know, designers, architects, people in our community who might have some really cool ideas that we might not be tapping into if you've seen ways that communities have done that. <laughs> I have seen several different approaches to that, Kate. So a couple of them, and and you know, forgive me for talking product for a second here, I guess, you know, but um, you know, one of them, I'm trying to remember the name of this company, Zen City. Zen City does some interesting stuff where they actually go through and automatically crowdsource out of social media in your community topics of concern for your citizens. Um, and they use that as a technique to go ahead and be able to find out what the pulse point of the community is on any given topic. And so I think to a certain extent, there's this element of like reading into your community dynamic there that they offer, which is an interesting one. Um, Bang the Table does Engagement HQ, um, you know, much larger, much more robust engagement platform with that. Um, and I've also seen my sidewalk used in very data driven ways. Um, and they're, you know, they do a great job with visualizations of data. And I think especially when it comes to 
in my personal experience, health issues, they do a great job at framing out health issues and making it relatable and translatable into other things like, um, you, you know, access to economic opportunities, um, you know, birth and death rates. And so I think there's a couple different answers. Bang the Table has done some really great work, though, in terms of creating opportunities for community engagements around specific topics. And even Granicus, for those of you that have used Granicus before, has vote up, vote down features, which I really like. So one community that I saw, they had so much uh, feedback, and I want to say it was in Missouri, but they had so much feedback coming from the community that they used a vote up, vote down method. Um, so what would happen is if you got over 50 votes, the city would engage on your topic. And if you didn't, then it sat out there until it got the 50 votes. And so at any given time, the community could choose not only the topic, but by popularity when the community would engage on that topic. Um, and I thought that was a really, I think that was a good balancing act, right? And especially with these topics, I think it would be totally reasonable to see something like an engagement HQ platform be used to go ahead and ask that kind of a question of the community and see them doing it. I have not specifically seen anybody ask questions about how you're dealing with winter yet, though. So I would be fascinated to find out what kind of conversation occurs around that. Okay, uh, Basalt used um, Bang the Table as part of our master plan process, and it was actually really interesting, granted. I don't know how you'd pull off this now because a lot of the master plan process was like literally like foam core displays of like, how would you use land here? But it, we also had an interactive, um, we were each given $5 million in little dollar stickers and like had to go around and vote on issues of like, where would we put the money? And it was just really interesting to get this like collective feedback and they, they did in a couple environments, they even did, um, I think planning kind of enjoyed it. They did a pub crawl and like went to different bars and asked people what their opinions were like in the bars so they could get a younger audience because it was um, most like one particular demographic that tend to show up to some of these other engagements. So they, they went out there and then a couple of years ago they did the Our Town um, planning process, which they even had kids like draw what they wanted to do with certain areas in town. And like my old office is like a train caboose and kids wanted to turn it into an ice cream shop which maybe somebody can do that now because I'm not in that office anymore. But it, it was an interesting way to engage, but I, a lot of it was also physical too. I, I think that's the challenge here is the, the physicality of this. And, and, and in anything with innovation right now, the challenge isn't necessarily the ideas. People think we have to be in a collective space in order to brainstorm, but really that's a bit of a fallacy. The real challenge becomes the actual implementation part, right? And actually doing the work when we have to socially distance or can't be physically in the same space in many cases to have that sort of, you know, guide point interactivity. Um, but I love that. And, and, you know, libraries, they're a great way to lean in on that, those kinds of community design efforts too. Libraries are sort of, I call them pseudo, I call them pseudo government proxies because they're like non-threatening government. So if you're government, don't be government, work with the library, be library and people will show up. <laughs> you know, if you're government walking in, people are like, Oh, I, taboo. You know, it's the number one fear in America for six years in a row is the fear of government. Um, you know, according to the Chapman University study, check it out yourself. Uh, but they do a top, top, top 10 fears in America every single year. And, uh, low, and, and uh, fear of government corruption is number one on the list. So people are starting off from a position of being afraid of us, which makes it really hard for us to engage. So we've got to do whatever we can. And like Chris said, right, like pub crawl, Really non-threatening way to get into the, you know, get in the door on that stuff, right? Drawings with your kids, really non-threatening way to get in the door. Um, but definitely, yeah, that's those are those are great. Would love to hear how you might choose to engage those on winter activities or what we do with the winter, uh, which would be really interesting. I think I saw Kevin pop on there with a, a thought too. I'm not sure if I'm calling you out, Kevin, or not. No, thanks. I was just, uh, I, I, uh, I like your perspective about the 97% of the, of, of the land being populated by, in the ownership of 17% of, of the population, but an important connection to that is water. Uh, without water, and this, this is where my lack of innovation may be showing, without water, land has no value. Fair enough. Maybe we can innovate a way to have to put value to land without water. I don't know. 
Well, and especially in a state with primary water rights, right? Yeah. I mean, that that issue of I, you know, somebody please tell me the value of secondary water rights. Uh, I can't possibly fathom at this point, considering all primary water rights are spoken for, right? Um, but you're absolutely right, which is to say that's going to be one of the predominant challenges here over the next even 100 years is what happens with water. And and if you see communities like, you know, especially Castle Rock, right? It's a community that basically has no water and it has no water rights. And so they moved 20 years ago to full Xeriscape requirements on just about everything. And if you're looking for an example on how to Xeriscape, they've been a leader in that because of that issue, right? So when you talk about water as a, as a driver, you know, I think maybe it's the driver for innovation in this case, which is to say the scarcity of that resource becomes that driver. So what is it we can do to go ahead and and prep ourselves for reduced water usage, the ability to store water, which, you know, the rain barrel conversation was insanely laughable and pretty funny, you know, but we can now have rain barrels in the state, you know, and, and I was part of that effort. And it seems so silly, but it took years to prove it. You and know, that's really an area where rural needs to be rethinking their concept of water. <clears throat> uh, they need to be looking at zero escaping. They need to be looking at, at uh, ordinances for gray water circulation and, yes. and barrels. And they need to be doing it now, which is a really steep hill when you're in areas that we just gave up our blacksmith shop last week. But I think to your point, Kevin, you have an opportunity now because like so much of the state's on fire. Um, but maybe it's a consideration of if you don't have wire, water, things are going to burn. So therefore, maybe we should do some things with, uh, you know, defensible space. And what's our code saying about that and, and redefining what normal is in terms of how we build, too, because you just assume like the next point of like, OK, 100 years out. What if there isn't water? OK, well, there's going to be a lot more fire and just assume that that's going to be the case. And, and then they burn twice. Forest management, watershed management. So yeah, we are we are at a we are at a tipping point where we need to be thinking about and 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 now this conversation is is water is probably even more important than the land that it's tied to. It's it's a critical conversation, and I think you know you hit on you hit the nail on the head though, Kevin. One of the s silliest but most important areas that we can actually lean in is the gray water. Right, the, the, the regulation around gray water is virtually non-existent in, in terms of allowing it. And so things that are specifically not allowed are specifically not allowed, um, which creates a huge problem when it comes to any sort of reuse projects related to water. And, and there is really no perceptible reason why I shouldn't be able to use collected rainwater to flush a toilet, right? Like, so, you know, those are the kinds of things where that's a great leaning in concept. Um, and Paradise, California is in the process of rebuilding, right? Completely got wiped out. But as we talk about wildfires, you know, they have done some things in terms of creating a green space around the community, intentional setbacks related to that. Um, they've moved to a low impact design model when it comes to their stormwater mitigation. So they're doing things I think that were forward leaning. Um, you know, Kansas, uh, what is it? Western Kansas, there was, and I can't remember the name of the community, they got wiped off almost completely. And it was a town of maybe 400 or so people. They rebuilt it entirely lead, entirely Greenwood. lead certified, right? So the community now has no footprint. Um, and again, that's because their entire community was wiped out. So when they went and rebuilt um, with the money there, they completely reimagined what the community concept looks like. And now they have virtually no footprint, a rural community who completely changed the game on how they operate. Um, and it's now a travel destination for people who believe in, you know, lead and lead building and, and green design. Um, and here they were sort of just a Western Kansas town, you know, before a tornado hit. So I believe personally that inside of chaos is opportunity if you know where to look. Um, and, you know, maybe we can find the silver lining with some, some very dark smoky clouds. Um, I see a couple comments here too. Just want to run through those real quick. Catherine came in with um, placemaking engagement we're working on in San Luis Valley. We're looking at including an innovation challenge coupled with a social entrepreneurship training. Those are some great concepts. Um, and yeah, Catherine would love to, if it's more appropriate to talk offline, would ha be happy to talk with you about what that looks like. Love what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah please do. I can, I can share real quickly. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna have to run to another meeting, but um, we're looking at the uh, working with the whole valley. So I've been talking with Kevin and um, several 
others there. Um, there's a big USDA placemaking grant right now. And so we are bringing together collaborators from all over. The idea is to um, enhance e-connectivity through placemaking to bring people into networks and then tap them into training for everything from workforce to to entrepreneurship, um, broadband, and linking in housing initiatives. And it's just uh, gaining a lot of steam as I've been talking to different folks. So I would love to connect with you. Um, maybe we can talk more about it. But I also wanted to make this group aware of it. Um, as far as I'm uh, aware, I don't think anybody else in Colorado is applying. And I'm Am I frozen? No. Okay. <laughs> Everything just stalled. Um, yeah. So it's it's gonna be pretty dynamic, and um, and I think that it will allow um for us to really reach uh, marginalized groups and ask them about the innovations that they would like to see going forward. So, um, I'd love to get you um you know, talking uh, about how to make that a successful project. I really think your ideas were very useful. Well, I'd love to connect with you on that and we can do that offline and, and you know, definitely have that conversation. I think, you know, for this purpose, you just hit on something else too, which is internet connectivity is an equity issue of the 21st century here, right? And whether we're talking rural areas in terms of broadband access, like that's an area that we can all lean in on, but we have to have it in, in order for this. And, and I don't think that internet access has been a predominant conversation in the equity conversation. But how are we supposed to live in a virtual world that's not connected if we don't have that access to it? You know, and, and, and I think that that is a really meaningful conversation. But I also love what you're talking about, too, Catherine, because the fact that you have a group and a consortium like this available to you and you're out applying for grants. In my experience, going through grant processes, if there is letters of support from team members on this kind of a team, you know, what a great boon. Even you're not applying for those funds but letters of support for you applying for those kinds of funds carries a lot of weight with the decision makers. They love regional teams like this coming together to put forward ideas for funding purposes. So um, this is a great network of folks and really a, a, an opportunity to put forward, yeah. I think really compelling competitive grant applications and have access to additional dollars that you all individually do not have access to as just one, right? And that's, that's what's been created. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll tell you another thing is even if this grant funding didn't come through, just the fact that we now have all those letters and all these people on record stating their support and inventorying all of the investments that they're making is amazing. So I feel like the last two weeks have moved us ahead light years <laughs> um, and it's been really exciting. So we are all about collaboration. So. Well, that's great. And honestly, when, when Kate contacted me, that's why I wanted to come and speak with this group is because this is the kind of thing that I love of and is the exact right way to spread the opportunity. You know, we're we're dealing with different challenges because we come from different geographies, but we have a lot of commonality in there. And there's a great amount of power in not replicating things community to community and continuing to fail the same way. Right. When we've got folks here that are able to do a pilot project in one area and learn a lesson so that you don't have to do it. You do a pilot project in a different area and learn those lessons, share those themes. That's your startup mindset, right? Like that's the turn it over, let's go kind of mindset. And that's where we really, that's where we can prove that this kind of an entity creates real value for others. And even outside the state of Colorado, I have seen so many great programs. DOTs have done a great job um, collaborating across the states in terms of innovation projects they've been doing, that kind of stuff, when it gets shared broadly, really creates a powerful network. And I, and I love what you're doing here because these challenges, while some are unique, the majority of them are not. They're just different regionally. And, and it's a great opportunity to partner on that. Um, I just want to comment, Anne threw in, it's Greensburg, Kansas. Thanks, Anne. Really appreciate it. That was the, that was the community I was talking about. Um, so love that. And threw in a comment here about, I'm sorry, Patrick, did you want to say something? Is, okay, joining on video, good to see you, man. Uh, so Anne threw in a concept, let's see, uh, what are your thoughts on some top examples of Colorado communities that are demonstrating futures innovations? Uh, what are the local government stories that you would highlight? 
you know, a tricky question. I guess part of what I would think here is that um, I think I'm seeing some great stuff about, I think what Colorado leads in personally is I think we do an incredible job related to stormwater, just as a really kind of weird branch uh, of this. And I've seen a lot of different creative uses, especially that came out of the flooding um, that happened a couple of years ago up by Boulder. You know, Kate, I'm sure is all too familiar with that. Um, but, you know, there was some really interesting reuses related to this. So I think we've done a good job at understanding how we can preserve and amenitize our waterways in the correct ways. And I think Colorado has done some really leading things in there. Um, as far as leading communities go, I've seen some very interesting examples. And so it's kind of hard because it's such a broad brush topic. I love a lot of what Fort Collins does. Um, what I think Fort Collins does well and better than, than most is that they're incredibly programmatic and logical about how they go through stuff. Um, and so they have embraced innovation, but what they've really done is they've embraced an efficiency culture that doesn't penalize. Um, and I don't equate efficiency and innovation. They are not the same thing. So let me just be clear about that. Um, they are used interchangeably in government. That's a huge mistake. Um, and so I think they're an incredibly efficient community that drives the right behaviors, but not through an innovation model, through a measurement and verification model. And that's why they have done a great job at achieving things like, uh, um, what are they, a silver community for, I'm trying to recall the, I'm drawing a blank on the uh, on the actual award they won, but you know some really prestigious awards because they're very methodical. And their story involves eight years of work to get to that award. So again, it wasn't an overnight thing, but they because they've got Darren Atterbury, very programmatic about how they go about it, and um, and he recognizes that there's failures and stumbling points. Great, we'll just get better. We didn't do it perfect. Let's get better, right? And that's the attitude that he has built into the culture there. And so I like Fort Collins a lot for that. Um, but in terms of individual innovations, that's a topic I could go on all day about. Um, so I don't want to do that because we don't have time. So, Clark, I want to let you jump in. I know I've seen you unmute a couple of times. I, I, I was just going to uh, compliment you. I think every one of your points here is outstanding, but I think it's particularly telling that you started off with redefined risk. I think in our true communities, you, you know, the old saying, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you already got. And I think that may be one of the hardest steps for a lot of our small communities to take. Well, I don't, anyway, I just thumbs up on, if you can get to that point, I think these other innovative conversations are, are very powerful. So uh, very, very well done. Thanks for this information. Thanks, Clark. Well, I know we're running out of time here today and I, I, just want to say before I turn it back over to Kate to kind of wrap it up, but I just want to say thank you for allowing me to come speak to you. Thank you for what it is you do for the communities you serve. Um, you, you know, I know the serenity prayer teaches us to accept the things we cannot change, but I would say to you, it's time to change the things you cannot accept. Uh, this is your moment. If you got into local government or if you got into these organizations to serve, now's your time. Um, so thanks for, thanks for your time. And I appreciate that. Well, I don't think we can do much better than ending on change the things that you cannot accept, but a big thanks to Nick. Um, you know, so much of what you've talked about, uh, this team has talked about along the way, and it's really good to kind of have that fire again, because everyone's been doing it for a while now and getting a little tired. And so this is just a lot of really great information, I think, to keep us all inspired and moving forward. So I really appreciate you joining us today, Nick. Thank you, everyone, and keep crushing it, okay? And I'm on your team if you need me. I'm right here. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. See you later. Bye. See you, Roger. See you, Nick.